Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, and thank you to the IYN for inviting me. Um, yeah, I should probably reiterate, uh, I speak purely for myself here, but um, I do teach at the OCHS, and uh, I guess that gives me something to fall back on, because uh, although yoga is a vast subject, there's only so much one can say about it, and uh, a lot of people have said a lot of very relevant things. So I've been crossing things out as I go, and... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully my talk is now a little bit more focused. I'm going to fall back on the ancient texts. Um, however, that raises a lot of questions in itself because one has to ask how relevant they are to what we do today. What is yoga in terms of today and what is yoga in terms of old texts is not necessarily the same. So let's get to the question. What, what is yoga? Um, I've seen it up on the screen a few times and heard people talking about it. There's, uh, generally a, a consensus, which obviously is well summed up by Patanjali, um, yoga is a meditative state beyond the mind. So put that in simple English, uh, sit down and shut up. So, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I suppose I should try and say some more, but that really is the point. Um, <laughs> there really isn't a great deal more to add. Uh, if we fast forward sort of a thousand years from Patanjali to the, the Hatha Pradipika, I mean, it says very straightforwardly, you don't get anywhere in yoga by talking about it. So again, I'll, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll try and get out of this uh, slightly onerous task of standing up in front of you trying to say something profound about an enormous subject. Um, I think really just to emphasize, as I did at the beginning, you know, Talking about success in yoga in traditional terms and success in a modern context, really two very different things. I mean, looking at the old text where there is that consensus, uh, it's not about contortions that look pretty on the internet, it's about disappearing completely from the world for the most part. Uh, people talk about stilling the mind when we talk about Patanjali, but his ultimate aim is detachment from matter, and uh, that's effectively disembodiment, or death, to put it more plainly. Um, and the Hatha Pradipika, again, it says something very similar. I'm just going to read a little quote here. The yogi who is completely released from all states and free of all thoughts remains as if dead. He is liberated. Of that, there is no doubt. Now, and surprisingly, we don't hear that very often in modern yoga marketing. Uh, <laughs> not so easy to sell workshops on spiritual suicide. Um, of course, we don't today have to take all that literally at face value um, or necessarily go all the way. Um, our priorities are perhaps not the same as those of an Iron Age ascetic being rewritten by Patanjali. Um, and in the Hatha Pradipika itself, there's a slightly subtler description of what that might mean. Uh, a couple of verses later, it says, The yogi in samadhi knows neither smell, nor taste, nor form, nor touch, nor sound, nor himself, nor others. Well... Although that still sounds pretty otherworldly, it's basically a flashback to the Kata Upanishad, which is the first text that gives a, a practical definition of yoga, which is restraint of the mind and the senses, and therefore practice of focusing inward. And that same description is repeated again and again and again. Now you hear it in the Mahabharata, which describes somebody who is engaged in yoga as being motionless like a stone. He neither hears nor smells nor tastes nor sees. He notices no touch, nor does his mind form conceptions. Like a piece of wood, he does not desire anything. Well, on the one hand, no more craving. That's got rid of one of the big problems that causes a lot of misery. But uh, are we aiming to be a piece of wood? Are we aiming to disappear to that extent? Uh, and more to the point, if we're not doing that, are we not doing yoga? Um, perhaps that leads to another question, though. Is yoga something to do or the outcome of doing it? Or even, is it something that isn't done at all, but rather that we have to stop doing so that the state of yoga might arise? Is, uh, is that really what the old texts were talking about? The ascetics of old were, 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 were trying to solve a problem in the mind that was getting in the way, as Vyasa describes it, of the underlying state of samadhi. So to overgeneralize massively, back to the beginning, is really what I was saying. Yoga is a state, and it's a state beyond time and space. It's very hard to pin down. And at the same time, that's not the whole story, because other texts come up with other definitions. We've already seen one on screen earlier from the Bhagavad Gita. Yoga is skill in action. That's almost impossible to get further from the idea of disappearing from the world, in a way. And without getting sidetracked by the politics and the history that produced that redefinition of yoga, um, we can just observe it's different. 
And that's kind of the problem. It's very hard to pin down a consensus in the yoga tradition. It's actually very hard to find one tradition. There are many different traditions. In fact, it's very hard to find one definition of yoga. If uh, you go to a Sanskrit dictionary, I've printed out here the uh, definitions from the Monier Williams Sanskrit dictionary. There's uh, several dozen definitions of yoga. Um, and very few of them have anything to do with what we think of as practice. Unless, of course, our, our practice is magic or deceit or uh, equipping an army by harnessing chariots. Uh, these are all <laughs> definitions of yoga. In fact, the earliest definitions of yoga found in texts are talking about connecting a chariot to animals to go to war. Um, okay, if we come back to something that's a little bit more familiar, the idea of connection and uh, connecting things more generally and perhaps in a yogic practical context... Even those references are confusing. What's being connected to what? It depends on the text. It depends on the system. And is it even the solution to try and unite things? For Patanjali, union is the problem. Patanjali's solution is separation. To detach uh, consciousness from matter. To isolate Purusha from Prakriti. So union is not his aim whatsoever. So we have to come back to that thing. If we're going to look at the text, we'll find endless reasons to get more and more confused. There's not a monolithic tradition, and there's a lot of disagreement. So I noticed up in, in Geza's presentation before, he had a reference to, to, to Shankara, who was dismissing Patanjali's yogi. Um, we often hear about Patanjali's sutras because they're at the root of the yoga darshana, the yoga school of philosophy. There are other schools of philosophy, of course, and uh, Shankara, one of the most influential philosophers of, of Vedanta, uh, particularly Advaita Vedanta, and he ripped Patanjali to pieces. In his commentary on the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, he said, uh, should the suppression of the fluctuations of the mind be practiced because it has a different purpose from the self-realization generated by the sayings of the Vedas and because it is enjoined in other texts, i.e. the Yoga Sutra? Uh, all a little bit waffly, but the answer is pretty straightforward. No, because it's not considered a means to liberation. And he also says Patanjali's theory is flawed because it sees the world in terms of two separate entities. Uh, as he puts it in his Brahma Sutra commentary, by the rejection of the Samkhya tradition, on which Patanjali's method is based, the yoga tradition too has been rejected. That is because contrary to revealed texts, i.e. the Vedas, the yoga school teaches that primordial nature is an independent cause, even though this is taught neither in the Vedas nor among the people. So what do we make of all that? Should we therefore always say that yoga means union and uh, that we should only ever be talking in terms of oneness, uh, such as the underlying unity of Atman and Brahman? Uh, but where does that leave other forms of yoga, devotional forms of yoga, in which there is a separation between the practitioner and the deity? What about Buddhist yoga, where there's no self whatsoever? Or, or Jaina yoga, or Sufi yoga, or make your bum look good in swimwear yoga? Uh, where, where, where do we pin it down? Yoga has to be defined in a context. As a result, though, we are faced with the problem that contexts change. Uh, objectives change. Our objectives in this room are probably all rather different from one another, although they may be in a similar area. So with all these different methods and different purposes, it's very hard to say which one is right. It also means there's probably no way back to some one true yoga, some primordial state before it all got corrupted, uh, that we can rewind to. Because throughout the history of yoga, ideas have been exchanged across different traditions. They've been copied and pasted, literally in some cases, from one text to another. Does that mean, though, that anything goes, that uh, anyone can decide what yoga is and mix and match to their heart's content? Probably worth questioning whether it's yoga to get drunk or to have a goat pee on your mat, um, because that might not really help with the process of focusing inward, which is something that most texts about yoga are talking about. And it's certainly not going to help with the goal of transcending the mind, which is the underlying objective, to get beyond the things that are getting in the way of who we really are. Because that's the message that keeps coming through again and again. Uh, we heard it in that video from Godfrey, De Godfrey Devereux. Uh, Self-inquiry, discovering who we really are underneath, resolving our confusion. So who are we? Um, should we become a somebody? Should we have millions of followers on social media? Or should we spend our time on Facebook uh, berating those people who do that as imposters, fake yogis? Is that the yogic response, to spend a load of time denouncing others while implicitly promoting yourself and perhaps your business as a more purist approach, as plenty of people do? 
So this brings me to the focus of my talk, uh, probably um, best summed up by the term the yoga police, the people who like telling others what to do, <laughs> while not necessarily doing any of it themselves. Um, I should probably clarify at this point that this isn't going to be a rant about being non-judgmental. Um, I think it's very important to judge quite clearly what is what. Uh, Patanjali agrees. He says that's the path to liberation. The means to liberation in Yoga Sutra 226 is uninterrupted discriminative discernment, uh, as the translation of Viveka has it in that version. It's very important, not just in his system, to know one thing from another. And it's also important to put things clearly so I should just go ahead and say it. I think the yoga police are un-yogic. <laughs> That's not going to say very much in and of itself. It really just turns the question upside down. Um, if you're asking what is yoga, there is obviously, therefore, by extension, something that is not yoga, which is what I'm calling un-yogic. Um, and I'm not, through that, trying to suggest that it's wrong to say that some things are wrong, although right and wrong is a a slippery slope, as Chris was observing earlier, but um, it's still important to be discerning, to tell one thing from another, and uh, particularly, uh, you know, we have a problem that abuse will thrive in contexts where people don't say one thing is right and another thing is wrong. Drawing boundaries is important, but uh, what bothers me is self-righteous posturing, telling other people what is and isn't yoga, and there's a lot of it around, has been observed repeatedly today. Um, I should probably sit down now, though, before I get into doing that myself, because uh, walking a very, uh, well, walking the razor's edge, as they say. Um, I've been asked for an opinion, though, so here we go. Um, it's unfortunately no surprise that I'm going to say yoga is self-inquiry. Um, it really is, again and again, what's explained in texts. It's a process of looking inwards, an introspective process, an experiential transformation, uh, an awakening into something uh, that has to be explored. Um, and even if Patanjali says that success in this practice can show you the minds of other people, I think most of us are probably struggling enough with dealing with our own. And uh, even if we do get somewhere with it to the point that we have refined sensitivity, knowing what's going on in somebody else is a very challenging thing. And uh, I'm always very suspicious when people think they know. Um, so I can't tell if somebody knows what yoga is from the outside, uh, or whether they're doing it, whatever doing it might mean, I can only really focus on removing my own illusions that get in the way of me attaining a state of yoga. Telling other people that they've missed the point is not going to help me in that process, as has already been observed. And just to clarify again, I mean, with talking about right and wrong, it all sounds very black and white, but uh, most questions of right and wrong are very grey areas. And they're personal matters, again. Um, yoga really itself is personal, even if the outcome is to go beyond the personalised worldview, to step into something impersonal. How we choose to go about that, what works for us, what we need, is going to be a very different thing. And besides, if we're telling other people who's right and wrong, uh, who tells us we're right and that we're not just deluding ourselves with more self-serving nonsense? The Upanishads have this all-purpose remedy for that problem. They keep coming back to the question of self-inquiry. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, the earliest, says, It is one's self which one should see and hear, and on which one should reflect and concentrate. For by seeing and hearing oneself, and by reflecting and concentrating on oneself, one gains the knowledge of this whole world. Sounds great, but how? Um, there are very few techniques taught in early texts, which leads us again to a problem with today. Uh, we want to know how to do these things, and, and they're challenging. They defy description. Which of these is the self, asks the Aitareya Upanishad, and then rules out everything it suggests as uh, another working of the mind. Is it that by which one sees, or hears, or smells, or speaks, or distinguishes between what is tasty and what is not? Is it the heart? Is it the mind? Is it awareness, perception, discernment, cognition, wisdom, insight, steadfastness, thought, reflection, drive, memory, intention, purpose, will, love, desire? answer to all of those is no, it's beyond all that. So as the Kaushitaki Upanishad puts it, it's not the mind that the man should seek to apprehend. Rather, he should know the one who thinks. The witness of it all. Unfortunately, as Yajnavalkya points out in the Brihadaranyaka, it's hard to perceive the perceiver. In the Kata Upanishad, death agrees, saying, rare is the man who knows it. It's much easier to get on your high horse and tell other people they're wrong. Now, I do think it matters to try and define what yoga is, and by extension, what it's not. Um, 
I've even written a book about it, and uh, that's going to be published soon. You can check my website. Uh, <laughs> oops. <laughs> I've just outed myself as an un-yogic hypocrite self-promoting, but it's danielsimpson.info in case you're interested. Um, anyway, back to, the, back to the business of the talk. Let's, let's sum up. The bell's going. <laughs> Defining yoga is personal, even if the outcome is impersonal, beyond the limited self and its gratification. The highest proof of knowledge in yogic terms is direct perception. So it's very clear where we should focus our attention on that witnessing presence that transcends thought. So we're back to where we started, and I should sit down and shut up. Thanks for listening. Thank you.